Hey, my name is Milan and in this video we're talking about a very important topic and that is how can you reliably test your application if it depends on an external service. This could be another microservice in your system or a third party API and I'm going to show you a library that you can use to mock external services inside of your integration tests. Let me walk you through the application that I prepared for this example. It's a .NET 9 API using minimal APIs and I configured a couple of services. First we have our EF Core database context connecting to a Postgres database and I have some YouTube API options and this is because we're going to integrate with the YouTube API. I also have a service that's actually an HTTP client and this is what's going to implement the communication with this third party API. And then we have a couple of API endpoints that we want to test. So I'm first defining a route group by calling the map group method and I'm defining a base route for the API endpoints that I want to create. And the base route is API slash content creators. Then there is a get endpoint to fetch all of the records inside of our database. I'm not really concerned with returning DTOs or change tracking. I just want the simplest possible implementation. We also have an endpoint for fetching a content creator by the ID, which can either return not found or 200 OK with the content creator response. And then we have a post endpoint, which is responsible for creating a new record inside of our system. It has a request object which only contains the channel ID that we want to insert into our system and we're going to use the YouTube API or rather the service wrapping this API call to pass in the channel ID and get back some information about this channel. Then we're going to check if we already have a channel with this name. So this is another thing that we could test inside of our integration tests. And in that case, we're going to return a conflict response. Otherwise, we're going to parse some information from the channel response that we got back from the YouTube API and then we're going to insert a new content creator instance into our database. So let me quickly show you how this works. If I send a get request to fetch all of the content creators in our system, we're going to get back 200 OK with an empty response body. This is because we don't have any records inside of our database. So I'll need to send a post request and this is the request body that I want to use and I'm specifying the channel ID of my YouTube channel. So let's go ahead and send this post request to our API and we're going to land inside of the post endpoint that I defined in my application. And what I want to show you here is what's happening inside of the YouTube API service. So if I step into this method, you will see that I have access to an HTTP client. And this is already configured to target the YouTube API based on my settings. And I'm going to use this API to send a request to the respective endpoint. And what I want to do here is send an HTTP request targeting the channels resource. I'm also specifying the parts that I want to get back in the response. So this is the data shaping response that the YouTube API supports. And if you want to learn more about this, I covered data shaping in depth in my Pragmatic REST API scores, which you're going to find in the pinned comment under this video. Now what happens after we construct the request URI? We're going to send a GET request using our HTTP client and this is going to give us back the response. Now you can see that the response contains my YouTube channel response object, which means that my API call was successful. And now I can return this back into my endpoint. And from here, I can extract the channel information, make sure that we don't already have a channel with this name. And then we're going to parse the subscriber count. You can see I have around 120,000 subscribers. So this is the most recent count. And it's interesting how the YouTube API rounds the subscriber count, even though the live count is a bit larger than 120,000. So nonetheless, we're going to create our content creator instance, add it to the database and persist it. So let me press continue. We'll get a response back in Postman containing the information about this channel with the channel name, the display name, the description, and some additional information. Then in the headers, we can find the location header where we can send a GET request to fetch the newly created resource. And if I send a GET request to fetch all of the content creators, we're going to get back the one creator that we have. Now let's say I want to send this post request again. Let me press send and we're going to land on the same breakpoint. And this time our uniqueness check is going to prevent us from creating a new record because we already have a channel with this name and we're going to return a 409 conflict response. Now let's talk about how we can write an integration 
sufficient test for this application because it depends on the YouTube API. So why is it problematic to write a test for an endpoint like this? Well, because we depend on an external service, we can't control the response that we get back. Moreover, we are also forced to use some real data because otherwise the third party API won't return what we are expecting. Another problem is that we are actually sending an HTTP request inside of the YouTube API service. So here I'm constructing the request URI and then sending a GET request to a real third party API. And if I don't specify a proper channel ID, or an API key, I'm probably going to get back a 404 not found response. And we can't really do much with this type of response inside of our tests. So I want to introduce you to WireMock, which we can use to mock the APIs that our application depends on. This could be a third party API. It could also be a microservice that is maintained by another team inside of our company. And WireMock allows us to spin up a mock instance of this API, send an actual HTTP request to this mock instance and control the response that we get back. WireMock also has a .NET library that we can use inside of our test project and that's what I'm going to show you next. So if I open up the test folder, you will see that there is a YouTube API test project inside. And if I take a look at the NuGet packages that I have installed here, you'll see that I have a couple of dependencies. First, there is the Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC testing library, and this allows me to spin up an in-memory instance of my API. Then I have test containers Postgres, which is going to allow me to run a Postgres instance in a container and connect to it from my test. And then we have the star of the show, which is wiremock.net. And this is what's actually going to take care of spinning up a lightweight HTTP server where we can mock the responses that we get back from the HTTP requests. Now, let me show you how we can actually use it. If I open up the infrastructure folder, first there is the custom web app factory. And this is a class from the Microsoft ASP.NET Core MVC testing namespace. And we have to specify our program file of the API that we want to be running in order to spin up an in-memory instance. I'm also using the iAsync lifetime from XUnit to configure how I start and stop my dependencies. Then I'm creating my two resources, the Postgres container, and this is made available by the test containers library. And I also have a property to expose the WireMock server instance. Then I'm overriding the configure web host method, and this will allow me to specify my application settings. So here I can pass in my connection string value, by saying use setting and then specify the configuration name and then I can pass in the value by saying database container get connection string. I'll do the same for the YouTube settings by specifying the API URL and we can get this value by accessing the WireMock server and then the first URL that's available. And then we have two methods implementing the iAsync lifetime interface, initialize async and dispose async. And this is where I can start my database container and the WireMock server. And then in the dispose async method, I'm going to stop the database container and dispose of the server. So this will take care of properly starting these services inside of my tests and then cleaning up any resources. Then I also need a base test class. And for this, I'm going to use a class fixture. This means that any test classes inheriting from integration test base are going to share the same state. And in our case, this will be managed by the custom web app factory, which means we're going to get one application instance per test class. And this also means one container and one wiremock server per test class. In the test setup, I'm going to expose my custom web app factory so that I have access to the wiremock server. And I'm also going to create an HTTP client that I can use to send HTTP requests to my API. Then we have a couple of helper methods that are going to allow us to fetch a single content creator, add a content creator in the test setup, clear the database if that's needed. And then we have the most important part, which is configuring the WireMock server. So let me walk you through what this setup looks like. We can access the WireMock server instance that is running inside of our test. And then we can define what should happen when we send a request. You can see it uses a fluent syntax and we can say WireMock server given our request with this specific path and this parameter using the get HTTP method. And this defines our request scenario. And then we can configure what should happen in the response. So we can say respond with and then create a response, specify which status code we want to get back. We can also configure any response headers and we can also provide a response body as a JSON document by passing in a response object. The WireMock server will take care of serializing this into a proper response. So you can see how we can define a complete API request, including a request 
and the response and it's also simple to control what is the response that we are getting back. I also have another example where we can pass in a channel ID but the YouTube API doesn't know about this channel. So it's going to return a YouTube channel response where the items collection is empty and in this case our YouTube API service is going to return null and our endpoint is going to fail. So just a quick recap of how all of this works, inside of our custom web application factory we're using the Wiremock server to access the URLs where the server is going to be running on our local host and then we're going to set this value as our application setting. This is going to be bound to the YouTube API options which we are using here to construct the request URI. So now when we run our tests we're going to be sending a request to the YouTube API running inside of Wiremock and inside of our base integration test class we can configure the request and response that we want to get back from the Wiremock server. And finally let me show you our test cases. Now I'm going to skip over the test cases for the get endpoints and I want to show you the create endpoint test because they are more interesting. So this is my first test case where we have a valid channel ID and sending this request should return a content creator. So we construct our request object, we also configure the YouTube response that we want to get back and then we set up our Wiremock server. So now I can send a post request to my API endpoint and I'm going to ensure that we get back a 201 created status code and that the response contains the content creator instance. We can also verify that this record is present inside of our database. Then let's say I pass in an invalid channel ID. In this case we should get back a 404 not found response and you can see how easy it is to set up a test case like this and then we can also test our conflict example where we can insert a content creator into our system and then send another request to try to insert the same creator. However we're going to configure the mock YouTube API running inside of Wiremock to return this creator instance and then make sure that our API responds with 409 conflict. Now let me go ahead and run all of my test cases to make sure that they are all passing and this might take a couple of moments because we have to spin up our Postgres instance, set up the Wiremock server but eventually our tests are going to execute and you can see that all of them are passing. Now another thing you can do here if you have something like ReSharper you can run a code coverage report by executing this command cover all tests from solution and I'm going to run this, this is going to execute my tests and produce a code coverage report and you can see that the code coverage for our solution is 90% but we are only concerned with our source folder and we can explore this further to see where we are lacking code coverage but if you take a look at the program class which actually contains our free API endpoints you can see that the code coverage in this case is 100%. Now be aware that code coverage is a useful metric in terms of it tells you which lines of code are covered by your test but it doesn't tell you anything about the quality of those tests and it definitely doesn't tell you that your solution is free of bugs. What I mean by this is that you should use code coverage together with some other quality metrics to determine if your tests are valuable and which part of your code base deserves more tests. If you enjoyed this quick overview of Wiremock make sure to smash the like button. If you want to grab the source code for this video it's going to be available from the pinned comment right below and if you want to learn more about code coverage then I suggest you watch this video next. Thanks a lot for watching, check out my courses if you want to improve your software architecture skills and until next time stay awesome.